Life at sea during the Age of Sail had its ups and downs. The steady rhythm of the sea alone was enough to reduce many men to a chronic state of seasickness. But it wasn't just the tumultuous oceans that could make it hard to keep down food. The horrifying punishments used on board military vessels created a sickness of another kind, one of rigid hierarchy and brutal, even torturous discipline. Whatever the crime, punishment in the Europe's naval forces was likely to be swift and harsh. Here we'll find some of the most serious punishments practiced by the navies of Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. In many ways, flogging remains the iconic symbol of the cruelty of life at sea during the Age of Sail. Certainly, flogging remained the most common of all punishments used to maintain ship discipline. Also known as whipping or caning, flogging involved the administration of blows to a person's back with a whip or a rod. This may be a textbook definition, but it fails to capture just how awful this form of punishment really was. The instrument used for the punishment, for example, deviated massively. Sometimes the chosen weapon would be a wooden rod or a leather belt, an instrument capable of inflicting serious pain and even wounding cuts. Brutal, but not much different to the kinds of corporal punishment found in schools at the time. The harm caused by such instruments was as much from the public humiliation as it was from the physical discomfort. A glowing red backside did little for a sailor's reputation, with his crewmates. However, there were much more serious tools used. The cat o' nine tails, a type of whip used by the Royal Navy, was one such weapon capable of causing real bodily harm. The appearance of this tool is somewhat harmless, a handle connected to some limp looking strings, but appearances can be deceptive. Sporting nine cotton cords known as tails, the cat o' nine tails was studded with up to three knots on each length of string. These were responsible for its fearsome impact wounds, creating numerous cuts when striking flesh. These lacerations resembled those created by cat claws, hence the name. Weighing 370 grams and comprised of intertwined threads of cotton unraveled and woven in a tight mesh, the whip was flexible, allowing for the application of force behind it. Concentrated on the knots and the tails, the deep cuts caused by the cat o' nine tails resulted in excruciating pain for the victim. Sometimes metal barbs and other nasty devices would be sewn into the tails, as to maximize the cruelty of this flogging device. Only a few blows were needed to skin a man's back and leave it a tangled web of crisscross knotted scars. With their shirt taken off and their wrists tied to a grate or post, the whipping of a man would always take place in front of the assembled crew. To much fanfare, a sentence would be read out and the man would be allowed to admit to his crimes and apologize. If he were especially brave, stubborn or foolish, he could protest his innocence and bemoan the injustice of the punishment. The man doing the whipping rarely held a sympathetic ear to this sort of thing. Then came cuts or lashes administered by the boatswain, the feared head of discipline on board. These would come with such force that one observer of a flogging stated, the sound of blows across the naked back of the sufferer may be heard at a distance of a hundred rods, which is about 500 meters away. The screaming man suffering under these blows was at least as audible. After a significant number of lashes from such a whip, cuts would land upon cuts and the back of a victim would become a painful mess, open for infection. As a matter of fact, the phrase to rub salt in the wound originates in the use of the cat o' nine tails. In a desperate attempt to prevent infection, sailors would pour salt over their backs, chewed up into ribbons by the flogging. This, as the phrase suggests, was an incredibly painful process. 
It was also, as some ship surgeons must have known, completely useless. Seawater contains a host of bacteria. All this process would have done is hurt. One dozen lashes was the most common number to receive, and a common sentence it was too. Minor misdemeanors such as drunkenness, answering back, or a poor work attitude could land such a punishment. A sentence of 1,000 lashes was effectively a death sentence by whipping, for nobody could be expected to survive such a punishment, although this number of lashes was reserved for what those in charge felt were serious offenses, such as mutiny, murder, or horrendously, homosexuality. One man in the Navy was sentenced to 400 lashes, but having received around 175, he was let off. The man would spend the next three weeks in a hospital. The Cat o' Nine Tails clearly was a fearsome instrument of flogging. Others existed that were as brutal, but none of these reached anything like the popularity of use the Cat o' Nine Tails achieved. Its usage even influences our language today, through the popular idiom, not enough room to swing a cat. Yes, the expression doesn't come from people of the past swinging kittens by the tail, it comes from the cat o' nine tails, meaning not enough room to swing a whip. Spread around the world in the bellies of British shipping, the cat o' nine tails found use globally, shaping the way not just sailors were disciplined, but soldiers, slaves, and criminals too. Sadly, this piece of naval heritage has yet to be confined to the history books entirely. Although not practiced in the United Kingdom since 1948, the practice of flogging remains in many former parts of the British Empire, especially in the former colonial possessions of the Caribbean. Like flogging, Running the gauntlet was a punishment for which the whole crew were gathered on deck to witness. This is a common theme of these punishments, for their purpose was always as much to punish the victim as it was to frighten the rest of the crew. With little to incentivize good behavior, for pay and rations were tight, punishments were important to discourage bad behavior. Running the gauntlet takes this element of group involvement to the next level. Rather than just observing the punishment, the crew became actively involved in carrying it out. Used since antiquity in the armies of Greece and Rome, as well as other armies since, running the gauntlet involved a condemned man making circuits of a ship, walking round it while his crewmates struck out at him. Forming parallel lines for the sailor to walk through, crew members would lash out with their legs, fists, and weapons, striking the person as they passed through the ranks. Various rules existed, though they differed from ship to ship. Edged weapons were generally banned, and the runner was often given the opportunity to shield their face with their arms. Running was allowed, but seen as highly dishonorable, and might provoke greater aggression from the surrounding crew members. Here was a way for crew members to not only pass judgment on fellow crew members who broke rules, but to act it out themselves. This mental separation from a crew member and complicit role in their punishment was a highly effective way of mentally separating the two, helping create a heightened sense of us and them, obedient and disobedient. Running the gauntlet could backfire on the captain and his authority, however. Relying on the crew to punish a fellow crew member was a bad choice if the punishment was seen as unfair or if the sentenced crew member happened to be very popular. This happened in 1760. Francis Lanon, a seaman aboard the HMS Royal George, was sentenced to run the gauntlet three times. The crew were clearly sympathetic to the man, for he received no real punishment at all, and all who struck him did so only for show. As we can see, despite the brutality of the punishment and the era, there were moments of compassion and friendship still to be found. Keel hauling was a particularly horrifying form of punishment and potential execution used on sailors, especially in the Dutch Navy and British Royal Navy. Tied onto a line looped around the vessel, a sailor had a weight tied to his legs before he was thrown overboard. Plunging down on one side of the ship, the sailor was then dragged under the keel and pulled out on the other side. If they were light, their momentum would not get them further than the bottom of the ship. 
Passing from bow to stern along the length of the ship, these sailors would be dragged along the barnacle-covered underside of the vessel. As any diver will know, these barnacles have incredibly hard shells, and sharp serrated edges that can puncture skin easily. This bristling shell of marine life would cut like razors as the sailor was dragged across it. The result would be a series of lacerations across the body, leaving the victim scarred and at massive risk of infection, especially as large amounts of marine life would likely be embedded into the wounds. Medicine was crude in treating this sort of thing, even on the mainland. While at sea, medicine was often little better than amputations carried out by the ship's carpenter. In agony, as suppurating wounds, inflamed and rotting, sapped the strength from the victims' exhausted bodies, few of these men survived their next few weeks. Heavier sailors avoided some of this, for their momentum carried them past the bottom of the ship during the initial descent. As they surfaced, however, they would rush up straight into the bottom of the ship, colliding into the hull or keel. The head trauma this caused would, if not fracturing the skull entirely, leave the sailor unconscious and at high risk of drowning. In a type of cruel mercy, the unconscious men would be spared the awareness of pain as their bodies were then dragged along the bottom of the ship. If the sailor survived the first round of punishments, it may then be repeated. In such cases, the injured and bleeding man would be given time to rest. This was not to allow them to recover, but instead to ensure they felt the pain of each descent round the ship to the maximum possible extent. Keel hauling was cruel, but served a very specific function for naval commanders. Like flogging, where men were tied to a post and whipped, keel hauling was a show punishment. This is a type of discipline focused on shock. Show punishments, focused on creating an image so horrifying in the minds of all watching, so that other potential offenders would be frightened into obedience. The kind of atmosphere present during this gory show is hinted by a Dutch painting by Liev Pietzers. In it, the keel hauling of a ship's surgeon is shown. The sense of occasion is evident, with men from numerous other vessels rowing out to witness this poor man's fate. Thus, keel hauling represents a kind of psychological control, with the incredible pain of one member, witnessed and felt by all, serving to warn onlookers. With supplies often tight and conditions often cramped, social control was vital in ensuring a vessel crammed with violent, hungry and drunken sailors remained disciplined. Keel hauling demonstrates a vicious and cruel, but important aspect of life for mariners sailing on the high seas. Although banned in 1720 by the British and 1750 by the Dutch, the practice cropped up from time to time until at least the mid-19th century. With its likelihood to either kill outright or permanently maim, keel hauling represents one of the most fearsome forms of punishment at sea. Severe shows of gore and obvious cruelty, either through extensive flogging or keel hauling, were ways of keeping the crew obedient. However, sometimes an execution required more straightforwardly brutal methods. The most severe punishment in any naval body was usually hanging at the yard arm. This was the large pole that went through the mast. With bound hands and feet, those to be hanged at the yard arm would be slowly pulled up by one of the many thick ropes on the ship's rigging, attached to a noose wrapped around their necks. In solemn silence, the entire crew would watch as these men slowly died of strangulation. With many onlookers having shared living space with that man, having often traveled for months together, sharing everything from food to life stories, this grim, silent affair must have been particularly awful. Seen as the final punishment for serious crimes such as desertion or mutiny, hanging at the yardarm acted as a powerful deterrent to anyone thinking of rebellion, dangling the victims prominently on the ship for days or even weeks before being cut down. This list of cruel punishments used in the Age of Sail is far from complete. Added to this repertoire are other methods of social control such as summary beatings, solitary isolation, and partial starving. 
Such methods, however, remain only too common in armed forces and conflict areas to this day. The methods of punishment listed here shock us with their cruelty, and rightly so. To witness any one of these must have been traumatic, even to the seemingly thick-skinned men of the past. But what makes these punishments truly interesting is that they speak to another social reality, one just as cruel, but harder to describe. Life on board a ship during the Age of Sail was a reality of hard labour and daily difficulties, one of frustrated desires and unexpressed pain. The men in these navies had no love for what they did. Naval life required high discipline and hard work, and the pay crews received for that effort was not great. Few were attracted to this life often viewing ships as little more than floating prisons. The death toll seen on board was significant too. Even in peacetime, ship owners and governments routinely estimated that 50% of sailors on a voyage would die of diseases such as scurvy. Consequently, in the 18th century, the British Royal Navy and Merchant Navy would recruit between 50,000 and 100,000 men yearly, just to replenish the ranks and keep the system afloat. No wonder few dreamed of a life in the Navy. In fact, many were forced into being sailors, some by circumstance fleeing from debts, abuse or disgrace, while others were quite literally forced into the position, captured while sleeping rough or drunk in a controversial process known as impressment. Given these conditions, it is not surprising that many sailors wanted to desert the ship or mutiny and get rid of the captain. Practices like flogging and running the gauntlets, like keel hauling and hanging at the yard arm, are symbolic of all of this. Faced with the prospect of months at sea, surviving off meagre rations with naught but the company of work and men, it didn't take much to entice the crew into disobedience. Cruelty was needed to prevent normal people from acting in logical self-interest when faced with such horrendous conditions and cruelty these methods employed in boatloads, using physical torture, social humiliation, and a reckless disdain for the value of life to beat the disorganized sailors into shape. It is no wonder such men searched for their fates at the bottom of a bottle, or even in open rebellion on the decks of a pirate ship. Such brutal forms of naval punishment must have been enough to make even the hardiest of sailors contemplate a career change. But it was decided that wars had to be fought and buccaneers needed to be held back. To those in charge, if it took flogging to achieve, then flogging it would have to be. And there you have four brutal forms of naval punishment. Feel free to leave your own thoughts and reactions in the comments section down below. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.